All right, hello everyone. I'll get started here. Um, my name is Chris Hayes. Uh, I'm a journalist. I uh, host a television show on MSNBC, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here with this incredible group of people to talk about an issue that I think we, I have occasion to think about obsessively every day. Um, right now, actually, is the Turkish intelligence services uh, leak incredibly lurid and astounding details that we have no way of verifying. <laughs> uh, clearly with a geopolitical imperative motivating it, there's a question about what you do with that and that's a question that's been haunting us I think for several years and really exploded out into the open recently. So I'm really glad to do this panel on national security journalism in an age of disinformation. Um, I will give a brief introduction to the speakers but there's a, I imagine you have biographies there and you guys all seem totally literate, so I will, I will be very quick. Um, uh, starting here to my left is uh, Carol Lennig. She's a three-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, investigative reporter. She's worked at the Washington Post since 2000. Um, she's done tremendous reporting on a variety of topics, uh, including the Russia investigation. Uh, her incredible work on the Secret Service uh, won her a Pulitzer uh, and turned into a book. Um, she's two-time winner of the George Polk Award. Um, and uh, is an incredible uh, credit to the profession and uh, one, of the, one of the best reporters, I think, working today. Um, Natasha Bertrand is a staff writer at The Atlantic. She covers national security and the intelligence community. Uh, she began at Business Insider and then moved to The Atlantic. She is uh, also uh, a contributor for NBC News and MSNBC. Um, I'm not going in physical order, as you can tell, as you look <laughs> at David McGraw, who does not have that bio. <laughs> um, David McGraw is the... Uh, Principal newsroom lawyer for the New York Times is a job that strikes me as utterly fascinating, particularly in this moment. Um, he spent 16 years at the Times, currently holds a position of Deputy General Counsel, and he's the author of the forthcoming book, Truth in Our Times, Inside the Fight for Press Freedom in the Age of Alternative uh, Facts, which is a first-person account of legal battles that have helped shape the coverage of the paper of Donald Trump, Harvey Weinstein, and others. And David Posen is a professor of law at Columbia Law School. Uh, he teaches and writes about constitutional law, national security law, information law, among other topics. He's written several incredible articles about leaks and transparency uh, that have really helped shape my own thinking on these topics. Um, he is the inaugural visiting scholar this, uh, for 2017 and 2018 at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. He worked for Harold Coe and clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens and also um, Judge Merrick Garland before that. So. Um, Great to have you all here. Um, I'm not gonna give any f opening statements and you guys aren't either, so we'll just start with questions. So, um, yeah, let's get to it. The, so here's where I thought we would start. I think one of the difficulties of our current time is a kind of relentless presentism in which every historical antecedent has been washed away down a memory hole. Like, never before has someone X. And often when you like, do a little Googling, like someone before has X. <laughs> like, it's a long country and there's been a lot of crazy stuff that's gone down in America. Um, so I guess what I wanted to start with each of you maybe, or whoever wants to talk about this, about what does feel different now? Like, what is genuinely distinct about the landscape right now of disinformation, sort of weaponized leaks, um, and, and sort of patrolling the boundaries in journalism that you have to, uh, as opposed to, say, 10, 20, 100 years ago? Mm. I, I like want to collect my thoughts and, and let someone else blurt something out. But the first thing that comes to mind for me, Chris, is um, every presidential administration has forces for good, forces that are slightly cunning and, and maybe even nefarious. Every administration has people who are truth tellers, who are um, obfuscators and schemers. But in this administration, what has struck me is how few people actually know the facts of the answer to the question you are seeking. And that is a, a fairly stunning development. People ha in the Obama administration would often say to me things that were misleading. Um, they parsed their words carefully. They avoided saying exactly what they hoped um, I wouldn't focus on. But but they had the facts at their disposal and they knew what they were saying and they were carefully crafting their statement to avoid something embarrassing. This administration and, and many of the ancillary parts of it 
um, don't seem to have clarity on the facts so that we can get them. I think there's also, Natasha, I'm curious if you want to follow up on this. To me, one thing that I can count of is that their incentives are all screwed up. So usually the incentive of the White House is particularly along mundane manners. They want reporters to get the story right. Like just basic stuff, like the president's going to go to do this event or we issue this executive order because you, you, know, you want the truth to be told about the thing you're doing, what you're proud of. They actually have the opposite incentives. I genuinely think that they, in, it, is, it is to their benefit for reporters to screw up and they enjoy that. It is part of reporters l looking bad. And so they, th there's, a, there's a little bit of an incentive problem. Um, you see this all the time with like trial balloons that are floated around family separation or the, the latest r reporting on transgender policy where there's a sort of lack of clarity that combines with what you're talking about, Carol, which is they don't actually, there's a lot of people in the shop that don't know what's going on, but also the fact that people getting it wrong will in some weird way redound to their benefit. Right, so there's this pattern that the White House kind of has down to a pat, which is they float these trial balloons, just like Chris was saying. They kind of use the press as guinea pigs to float an idea. And then once the press reports on some kind of leaked document or a plan that the administration has for something, then they can immediately come out and say, no, that's fake news. For example, another, another issue is when the press goes to the White House, asks for a comment on something, and they refuse to comment. And then as soon as the press writes a story on it based on other sources, other reliable sources, they come out and say, no, that's fake news, even though they refuse to comment on it or correct it in the first place. So that is a very, very big problem. And I think that I think that it's also not only to the White House's benefit that the press get things wrong, but they also put things out there in an effort to confuse the public even more. Um, I think that disinformation is definitely a, a goal of this White House, and of course that is something that they take from authoritarian regimes around the world, people that Vladimir, that Donald Trump looks up to, like Vladimir Putin, like Kim Jong-un. I mean, these are the model right now for their treatment of the press, and that is a huge, huge issue um, when it comes to reporting uh, national security issues in, in today's space. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in on this one as well. Uh, right, the legal, the boring legal perspective. Um, I, I think there's two things. One is that I think there's been a breakdown of the consensus about the importance of a free press. Um, and I think that's really a dangerous place to be. Uh, my job used to be really easy because it, I could talk to liberals, I could talk to conservatives, we all agreed about the value of a free press. 2010, Congress passed the most important libel litigation in the history of Congress, I'm pretty sure ever, uh, in, in, <laughs> in protecting US publishers against foreign libel judgments. And the only important thing in my mind about that is that the vote in the House was unanimous. The vote in the Senate was unanimous. Hmm. Nobody opposed that. Everybody thought that was a good deal. And I think that the, the breakdown of a belief in, in, in freedom of the press is, is, is really a serious problem. The second thing is, is uh, I think, more obvious to any of you who work in the national security sphere, and that is, um, I think it's unprecedented the use of foreign intelligence services uh, to hack into email accounts and make those available to the press. And I think that's a really, really difficult issue for everybody in the process um, because it really pits this uneasiness I think most people feel about being used or at least being a vehicle. And at the same time, valuable information in yes. most cases, very, very valuable information. And how you thread that needle um, is difficult. The law is actually pretty straightforward that, uh, at least in, in my view, that uh, you can publish that information. It's true and, and therefore the First Amendment protects you. The hard questions are all at the, uh, on Carol and Natasha's side, which is should you? I'll just, I agree with all that. I'll just add that um, uh, in addition to the shift from leaking to hacking, which raises a lot of tough new issues, um, in the area of leaks itself, there's also been legal movement. Uh, the criminal enforcement rate is uh, clearly up. There's a lot of talk about how under the Obama administration, depending on how you count, uh, eight or so leakers of classified information to the media were charged, criminally charged. Uh, in the first half of the first term of the Trump presidency, that number, again, depending on how you count, is, uh, is, seems to be five. So um, uh, there is uh, a continuation of a trend that started roughly a decade ago of uh, enhanced enforcement against leakers. Um, I think the reasons for that are, are many, and I'm happy to talk about it later, but they relate to what David was saying about um, 
the basic orientation of this administration toward the press, how it wants to be perceived by the press, um, uh, is, is part of the calculus. And just going back quickly to what you said about um, foreign intelligence services and how they're trying to exploit our democratic processes, I think that part of what is making that easier and easier is just the number of tools that journalists now are making available to potential sources that grant them complete and total anonymity. So things like secure drops um, that are on the New York Times website, for example, and others, um, you know, apps like Signal, um, you know, all of these tools are just, for lack of a better word, are maybe incentivizing yeah. bad actors um, or, you know, actors with a very specific motivation that you might not be able to discern because they're granted this total and complete anonymity. And I think that that is also, the, the journalist's willingness to grant people anonymity is also a, a product of a more and more competitive news environment. I mean, you know, scoops are the, the measure these days um, of a good newspaper, of a good journalist. So that's another really big issue is how do you prevent um, a paper or a journalist from being a tool of a foreign intelligence service when you really don't know a lot of the time who's giving you the information. Of course, there are ways that you can try to determine who leaked this to you, but ultimately, we are giving them a platform to do this. Yeah, please, you, you disagree. I, I do disagree. I would, I would say that we're not incentivizing people to hoodwink us. We are, my experience with the secure drop at the Washington Post is that it has brought us um, very, very close to people who view themselves as patriots, who are dealing in incredibly sensitive and often classified information. They are threading this incredible needle of not committing a crime, but trying to alert us to something important. And, and I know, I'm assuming the New York Times has the same view that the Post does, which is that just because somebody comes in over that transom, we don't buy them lock, stock, and barrel and believe right. them 100%. In fact, I have you know, some personal experience with feeling that somebody who came in over the transom was a complete phony, and we would never publish what that person said, as exciting as it was, and as beautifully as it fit the narrative that I thought was probably true, we are not gonna take anonymous secure but, drop material. Okay, but, but I wanna zoom in on this, because this to me is sort of one of the elemental questions before the panel and all of us. The reason you wouldn't, though, is about the truthfulness and your trust of the underlying facts as opposed to a determination that the agenda of the person doing it is, is somehow counts in some ledger against its publication. So, That's a key distinction, I think. So since time and memoriam, people have, reporters have been dealing with people who have kind of nasty motives. Mark Felt. Mark Felt. I mean, the guy wanted to be FBI director, and that's why he went to Bob Woodward. So. Woodward knew that, and we kept that secret for 36 years, I think. Um, Woodward knew that, but he weighed the Im importance of the information. There are a jillion examples of that in my career at the Post, where someone had complicated motives for coming forward. Uh, the troopers in Troopergate with Bill Clinton, they were mad that he didn't give them the job he promised. Did they have accurate information about speeding him to different hotel rooms to have sex while he was governor using state resources? They did have good information. And so I, I feel like in a way the technology is complicated and sophisticated and we, I totally agree with Natasha, we need to think hard about being responsible about that, but it's the same old game. It's people coming to us with information. Do you think that's true, David? Uh, I think in some ways it's, it's not, even though um, leakers may have complicated motives, sometimes unseemly motives, I still think there's cause to be qualitatively more concerned about hacks. Um, yeah. Leakers, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, everything that was just said about them, um, for a variety of reasons I think are likely to be more constrained uh, in what they give to the press uh, than foreign intelligence service, say, hacking. For one thing, Leakers within the U.S. government are subject to a range of sanctions for their behavior, so they incur some, some risk uh, in going to a reporter. Uh, there are uh, criminal sanctions we've just mentioned. Um, there are also administrative sanctions. A controlling executive order on classified information provides that you must actually be administratively sanctioned if you unlawfully release uh, cl classified information. There are also informal sanctions. A lot of times officials are suspected within government of being the source of a story, and they're shamed or shunned or cut out of the loop. 
Um, in addition, leakers who work on an issue in the government have often internalized to some degree a sense of the, the boundaries about what goes too far in undermining uh, the government's interests, even if you don't fully subscribe to a particular program or policy. Um, and uh, high-level leakers, at least, often have repeat play relationships with reporters. They're the source not just for a uh, particular story that runs tomorrow, but for many future stories. And therefore, they have to maintain credibility uh, with the media. So all of those elements are missing when it comes to foreign hacks, um, the, the possibility of, of sanctions and the uh, discipline that may impose, um, and the, uh, the sense in which the provider of the information has, has to some degree, even if they see themselves as a, as a dissenter or a whistleblower, um, uh, is looking out for the government's interest. Um, uh, so while appreciating the complexity of leakers, I, I, I do think um, they, uh, they operate within rough boundaries that tend to keep what they do roughly in line with the government's interest um, and the public's interest, and I don't have that confidence with hacks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, if, if media, if the news media looked like it once did, if it looked like it did in Daniel Ellsberg's day, this wouldn't be a problem, okay? If it, were, if it were up to the New York Times, the Washington Post to decide what of this leak to publish, I think most of us would be satisfied that, just as the Supreme Court was, that those papers are going to make responsible decisions and they're not going to intentionally do anything to, that's going to create harm, but they're going to be worried about what the public needs to know. That's not the world we live in. They, they, they don't need us. <laughs> they, they don't need gatekeepers. They, they can take it onto the internet, they can go to WikiLeaks, they can go to other places and get it out there. Um, I was called down to the newsroom one day uh, to look at the, what we now know as the hack of uh, Manafort's daughter's text messages. You know, highly personal stuff. You know, this was the kid, this wasn't Manafort, this was, this was his daughter. And so we were working our way through that, concerned about privacy, concerned about authenticity and so forth. And while we were doing that, the entire set showed up online. So our, our efforts were a little bit for naught. Although, I'll, I'll, uh, a great distinction there, which is that even though those are available, most Americans don't know what's in them because they haven't been run. Like, it makes a big difference whether something like that, which, by the way, is like in this crazy spreadsheet, and it takes a while to yep. understand what you're actually reading, although once you do, it's a sort of mind-blowing record. But uh, that, that most Americans don't know about it because the New York Times and the Washington Post haven't run with it. And Franklin Four very selectively used it in the Atlantic and his Manafort. Piece. But that, to me, that I mean, this this question about the sort of hack versus leak is a really elemental one, and also actually gets to me a sort of frustration of how under theorized I think what we do as reporters often is, because the fact of the matter is, you know, it's true and newsworthy. Is it true? Is it newsworthy? Can you can you corroborate it? And that's a very limited toolkit to deal with this stuff. And the hack blows all that up. It's both a a, a real problem from the perspective of, you know. I think sort of public discourse, but also it, I think it, 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 it sort of, it's a crowbar into this sort of theoretical black box that is the reporter's toolkit, <laughs> which tends to just be very much like, hey, it's true, it's newsworthy. We, we publish things that are true and newsworthy. The Sony hack to me is such an important moment in this trajectory because in some ways it was kind of trivial. It didn't, doesn't matter that much. I mean, they didn't want the, North Koreans didn't want the movie to run and there was a lot of embarrassing stuff in the hack and it wasn't, we're not talking about a cyber attack, we're not talking about massive affairs of state, but it, it worked. And all the stuff in that hack was totally newsworthy. It was done by malevolent foreign agents for the purpose of suppressing American speech. And the, the journalistic coverage of it 100% succeeded in producing the anti-speech aims of a totalitarian foreign state that it carried off the hack. Well, that's a nice spin to put on things. <laughs> well, but it's true. I mean, my point is that if that is the case, if that's taking place, then it seems to me that the whatever theoretical, whatever the sort of theory underpinning what you publish and what you do, don't, has to reckon with the fact that there are malevolent actors, to David's point, that are using this in a way that is yeah. invidious. You know, the Sony hack was interesting because the Times decided not to use the documents right. unless they were published someplace else first, in which case our... Uh, you know, our distaste for it sort of disappeared. It was already out there. Um, but it, it did feel differently than the Snowden leaks because it was a private company and it was about things that 
didn't involve national security or the future of the country or what have you. Um, but as often happens in these cases, you then had the Podesta and the DNC hack. Same thing is true. Those aren't government actors, but they are. They, I think that was an irresistible story. I think you have to cover that when you and and, I, and Chris is right. It's important to understand what journalists bring to that. I think that's why publications like the Atlantic, uh, the Times, the Post are still important. Uh, in some ways more important than ever just because of the massive amount of information that's going out there unfiltered. It's our, the challenge for us is getting attention. Right, and I mean, nothing journalists do is black and white. They're, I mean, they're really, when we decide what's newsworthy, what's worth publishing, there's really no strict guidelines that we look at to determine that. Um, but I do think that there were some things in the DNC hack and the John Podesta hack that may have been newsworthy and others weren't, but one of the biggest problems was that the media kind of treated the whole thing like it was entirely newsworthy. I mean, there were articles about John Podesta's risotto recipe that he had emailed to someone and that was put online. I mean, these are things that, you know, just by giving them oxygen, you, again, I'm gonna use this word, you kind of incentivize it. And that's why I think the example set by France when they put this kind of moratorium just as the Russians had dumped all these documents on the internet that they had stolen from Macron just days before the election. They put France, you know, we can debate on whether or not this was a good idea, but it's definitely an interesting case study. France said, we're not gonna allow the, the media, and this is something dating back 50 years, that we're not going, we don't allow the media to report on anything having to do with campaigns. We won't allow the campaigns to campaign even in the 44 hours leading up to the election. And that really served to their benefit because no one was covering this stuff. It didn't get any oxygen and it didn't influence the election in any meaningful way. Now, Macron, of course, has tried to extend that and make it so that in the three months, of course, in the three months before any kind of election, New rule. Um, there's, there's kind of a ban, so, so quote unquote ban on fake news, but of course then you know the government kind of becomes the arbiter of truth, so there's problems there too. But ideas are being floated now in a way that they haven't before on what to do um, when a foreign intelligence service is so clearly trying to meddle in an election. And I do think, I do think that the media has a responsibility to be wary of that. Do, do you think there should, so, so talk, getting back to this leak hack distinction, right? So the way that I've operationalized it in my show is, is a lot of it has to do around Elliot Broidy. So Elliot Broidy is, is an interesting case. He's a, uh, he was the deputy finance chair for the RNC. Um, <laughs> it was him. Steve and Michael Cohen serving under Steve Wynn, which is quite a, quite a trio. Um, and uh, he, it's a long, complicated story, but essentially sort of fell in with a bunch of actors and agents on behalf of the United Arab Emirates, who of course have been pursuing along with Saudi Arabia this incredibly pitched battle and feud with the state of Qatar. Um, that has resulted in uh, blockades and all sorts of madness that's gone around, and it's fairly clear, I think it's to say, the Qataris at a certain point were agents that were contracted by the Qataris, hacked Elliot Broidy's emails, and made them available to journalists for the explicit purpose of embar embarrassing Elliot Broidy, specifically as a kind of payback and as, as part of the feud with the, the, uh, with the United Arab Emirates. There have been lots of reporting, there's newsworthy stuff in there. I have not done that story specifically because it seems so clear to me what is going on. This is someone who, I say this is someone who finds the story fascinating and there's all sorts of juicy stuff and I'm not the biggest Elliot Broidy fan in the world. But I have not done the story because I have, that's my own little personal way of operationalizing the 2016 election lessons, which is this is very clearly a foreign intelligence service doing this towards a specific end and I don't want to be a part of that, but am I doing that right, Dave? I don't know. <laughs> the, um, I admire your you know, instinct to not legitimate foreign intelligence hacking and kind of uh, conflate it with, with leaking in your practice. Um, I, I guess I, I think the example um, and the way you frame the question just points to um, the sense in which the, the old norm that journalists, which, which David uh, uh, voiced, um, have been operating uh, with for several decades, a number of decades now, that we publish whatever is true in our judgment and newsworthy, and we assume that that roughly corresponds with the public interest, at least in the medium term and long term, um, that that norm uh, uh, 
is possibly coming apart from, from the public good, at least in, in some category of cases. Um, that, that norm is itself relatively recent. It didn't exist in any robust form until the 60s. It gets haloed to an extent after Watergate. As time goes by, the conception of what's newsworthy expands, I think, particularly in the national security, uh, uh, security area. Um, but it all, uh, what, what, what recently has happened with hacking, I think, reveals that that norm presupposed a set of facts that are changing, including that the material being provided didn't rest on massive privacy violations, um, that the material being provided was from a US source who, however complex, uh, was looking out for the US interest in, in, to some meaningful degree, not from a malevolent foreign actor, uh, and that the New York Times, as David was suggesting, the Washington Post could serve as gatekeepers for the information and prune the most worrisome bits. Um, all of those background assumptions have, have shifted. That does suggest to me that like you're trying to do, um, uh, it might be time to rethink the norm, at least at the margins. Uh, that said, I, I, I fully recognize that um, uh, it's very difficult to, to come up with a nuanced norm that can be oper operationalized consistently that would uh, still serve the press's watchdog function. Well, and to me, I think there's a, I should say, there's not like a blanket bar, Carol. Like, so if, if in the hacked emails, Elliot Broidy said, uh, I'm really sorry I had those three people whacked. Like, it doesn't matter if the Qatari hacker got, like, if he admits to murder um, in the emails, it's newsworthy. And it, it, it jumps over even the bar. But to me, the way that I've been trying to operationalize it is just like, if I suspect or think that the information I'm dealing with is specifically hacked, there's a higher bar to get over on the newsworthiness. Absolutely, you said it better than I can actually, but I'll try to give an example from the Washington Post files, which is we've been, we have not used um, Chris's hard line of we're not gonna do this story. We've been incredibly circumspect about using these hacked materials because we know their purpose. But let's be honest, there are other people with bad purpose. I could tell you stories about hedge funds that are bankrolling a $20 million deal and they're trying to provide us information to slam somebody on the other end of the deal. Their motives are profits, pure and simple. Do they have a story that's relevant to readers? That's the key. So in the Broidy ha hacked emails, we have used some. The same is true about our circumspection about Paul Manafort's daughter. We do not want to invade the very personal descriptions she gives of her personal life and her distrust of her father. We don't need to give ink to that because what is the relevance? I think we've used, don't hold me to the number, but I think we've used three of them that are very on point about her perspective of facts at issue in his criminal case. Uh, that's the test. But I, I would just push a little bit against this idea. I think David's totally right in, in distinguishing foreign intelligence hacks and leaks of people with motives. Russian intelligence have a way to leap into our, um, I don't even know how computers work, so it's gonna sound stupid <laughs> what I say now, but leap into our, the back sides of our computers, pull out information and <laughs> hightail it out of there. So they have a special gift that you know um, hedge funds maybe don't. Pretty soon hedge funds right, will. Right, yes, exactly, so, yeah. So this idea that people don't have malevolent goals, let me, let me rephrase. There are a lot of sources that have come to the New York Times and the Washington Post with malevolent goals who are not constrained um, by interests in the, in the government's best interest. And that's been going on before yep. this period. Is, is there a, from the legal perspective, I'm, I wonder, David, do you guys think about what the legal landscape looks like? Is there a legal distinction, I guess, to your mind between, say, things that are leaked and things that are hacked? When you're dealing with stolen material, is that at all legally relevant to the, the, the publishing decisions you guys make? I don't think it is. Um, this is one of those areas that I think is, is really hard for lawyers because no matter what you do in your practice, whether you're a divorce attorney or a criminal defense attorney or a First Amendment lawyer, we all come to believe in rules. And this is one of those places where leaking sort of exists and hacking exists outside the rules. So it's, it's naturally uncomfortable for us. But from, a, from a, the pure legal standpoint of can you publish, I think the answer has been given uh, in, in a case called Bartnicki decided by the Supreme Court in which uh, the court found that as long as the, 
the radio broadcaster in that case, but the, the media publisher, uh, uh, did not engage in the wrongdoing. The information's in the public interest. Um, and it's truthful that there is no remedy that can be imposed against the, the publisher or broadcaster absent uh, an interest of the highest order, which the Supreme Court has never found, hmm. it's never got there. So uh, I think most people feel that that, uh, that same rule applies uh, in terms of publishing leaks as of publishing hacked documents. But all of the things that we've been talking about make it that complicated, complicated calculation for journalists. And especially so, to go back to the Manafort text where um, someone has put in a fake document. And that becomes, that takes it to a whole nother level. The other- the, Wait, the, explain that. The, 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 there was a, an attachment that was attached, it was put into one of the texts it was by whoever was leaking this so that in the hopes that it would be picked up as authentic. And obviously, if you can imagine, you're looking at these things, you're, you have no way of authenticating all of them. You just assume from their appearance that they're authentic, and then you find out that someone's trying to set you up. Right. And that becomes a, a difficult calculation. I think the other thing I'd say here is that it goes back to what I was saying about the, what the law says, and that is the journalist has a First Amendment right as long as he or she did not engage in, 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 in illegal activity to get it. I, I do think that many times with uh, uh, the traditional sources that, that, that David was talking about, that line's pretty clear. I worry sometimes about the way electronic transfer of information happens. Will a court find that hmm. our accessing of a website was in fact crossing a line? It hasn't been decided yet, but, but that worries me. You're not talking about a specific website like WikiLeaks, well, are you? <laughs> not never about WikiLeaks. Well, that's, that, that was going to be my follow-up, because it, just, it does seem to me that we're, we're headed towards what could be a really extremely thorny set of questions around WikiLeaks, um, which is whether it is essentially an agent, of, a, a sort of unregistered agent of a foreign power, or a publisher with all the rights uh, and protections of a First Amendment entity. And I don't know how that gets resolved, but it does seem to me that if you look at the way that WikiLeaks is referred to in many of the charging documents, it is the theory of the case of the Mueller shop that fundamentally it is essentially a cutout for a foreign intelligence agency as opposed to something like the New York Times or the Washington Post. Yeah, and there's a really interesting case um, in, it's in the Eastern District of Virginia now. It's called Cochran versus uh, Trump, the Trump campaign. And essentially, people who had their information exposed by WikiLeaks during the 2016 election, things like social security numbers, very personal information, are suing the Trump campaign. Originally, it was Trump, the Trump campaign and Roger Stone. Um, Roger Stone was later uh, not involved in the case. But now it's just first of the Trump campaign. And they allege that the Trump campaign conspired with WikiLeaks and with Russian intelligence services during the 2016 election to release this information. And therefore, they are co-conspirators. So what the argument the Trump campaign has made is that actually this was their First Amendment right. Um, it was their First Amendment right to you know, talk about this stolen information, to, to discuss WikiLeaks, to as long as they weren't involved directly in the hacking, then they were free to use it as they wanted to. And it raises really interesting questions about what kind of, I think, you know, a separate and apart from the First Amendment questions, but which I think is actually pretty straightforward here, is that they do have a First Amendment right to do that. Um, but it raises more questions about the standards that should be set maybe by our leaders, by our political leaders. I mean, right. this is an argument that was made roughly 30 days before the midterms. They were essentially saying, hey, go for it. If hacked information is made available, then you should feel free to use it against your opponent. And it's a question that's also come up in a kind of a fight that broke out between the DCCC and the NRCC, which right. is the two congressional committees. Um, the two campaign committees for Republicans and Democrats where the Democrats essentially wanted this really tough black and white pledge from the Republicans that they too were going to sign saying we are not going to use any hacked information in ads um, or against our opponents in any way. We want you to pledge the same. And the Republicans said, well, 
we don't want to commit to that because what if hacked information is leaked through the press? What if it's already out in the public sphere? Then shouldn't we be able to use that? So it was really funny because going back to the Republican, um, the NRCC and trying to get comment from them, they were like, well, it's actually on you. You're the ones that should be making the commitment to not and to not publish this hacked material because once you guys do, then we're free to do with it whatever we want. And so they wanted to insert a provision into this pledge that was essentially like, the the media should be held accountable, not us. Um, so uh, more questions, of course, raised by this by this issue, but it seems to all come back to the press. At least that's what the politicians want it to be like. David. Um, I'll just add that, that, that for um, reporters, uh, there, there are a lot of interesting ang angles here, uh, but I basically agree where, where David ended, but the path there has been winding. Um, we know that the U.S. Justice Department has historically considered on at least four occasions prosecuting reporters uh, for divulging national security information. The Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department actually wrote an opinion in 1942, recently revealed uh, concluding that it would be consistent with the Constitution to uh, prosecute a reporter um, uh, uh, in wartime. Uh, and, uh, but those prosecutions have never come to be. No reporter has been charged under the Espionage Act. And uh, as David notes, there have been cases in the intervening years, including Bart Nicky, which while it can be read narrowly, I think is, is best read as standing for this broad proposition that the distributors of information uh, even if the information in the first instance was unlawfully obtained or is classified, um, are immune from criminal prosecution except in the most egregious of cases, um, even if their sources could be prosecuted for giving them that information. I've referred to this uh, in, in, in academic writing as the source-distributor divide in First Amendment law. Source uh, can be punished consistent with the First Amendment uh, in the national security area. Um, it seems, uh, and the distributor almost, almost never, but what these recent cases bring up um, are uh, what were always some vulnerabilities in that, in that settlement that emerged post Bartnicki. that again, the distributors can say whatever they want, sources can be held liable. Um, conspiracy, I think, was always a vulnerability in that settlement mm -hmm. because the court left open the possibility that if the distributor of the information conspired in its unlawful procurement, um, they could be treated like a source. Um, but never really clarified what that conspiracy would look like, and cases like WikiLeaks um, are at that, you know, that intersection of who's the source and who's the distributor, um, and putting pressure on the conspiracy side. Also, um, uh, as with the Trump campaign, um, in developing this, uh, this distinction, the court had in mind uh, a responsible press along the order of you know, the New York Times and Washington Post, and um, uh, it's conceivable the court could rethink that divide in the age when the distributor uh, looks um, uh, less public interested. Um, maybe, maybe I'll cut it at that. Yeah, and, and I just just one addition there because I, I agree with what David had to say is that um, where if, if you want to think about a practical practical issue in this is that somebody leaks something to the Times. We're we feel completely confident we're on the right side of the law, even if that person was the source engaged in wrongdoing. Inevitably, though, reporters will want to ask the question, can I ask that source to go get more? And you start to then get into, well, is that person now an agent? And I think most reporters say, how can the first one be OK and the second one not? But in the way the law works, it becomes much closer to the kind of conspiracy or aiding and abetting that, that David's talking about. I, I might just also add that it's, it's anomalous that in the law that someone who receives stolen goods could then use those stolen goods free from criminal liability herself. If you try to give me a stolen car and I have reason to know it's a stolen car and I go start driving it, I can be held liable too. So the, uh, uh, the situation journalists have operated in for a while now is a, uh, is a privileged one under the law. You mean like, um, Russia, are you listening? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I am definitely, David, one of those reporters who, who asked the question, um, I, this guy had some great material, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I need to understand yeah. it better, and I'm going to need to ask him more questions, yeah. and that will probably lead him to more classified documents. Um, and I, I can't see how that changes. I, I'm not asking him to yeah. steal another car. I think. I, I agree, I and I think I think courts would agree that I, I think reporters uh, should be much less worried about being prosecuted themselves, notwithstanding these potential. 
loopholes or nuances in the doctrine. Um, I think constitutional culture strongly suggests they, they wouldn't be prosecuted, they would win if prosecuted. Uh, I think it's, it's their records being subpoenaed for leak investigations into sources where reporters are much more vulnerable, um, uh, not to mention you know, what's gonna, whatever happens with their, uh, um, their, their being hacked. So the, the Russia are you listening line is, brings me to something that's a, a broader question, but I think a, a, as important as all this, which is about the way all of us think about transparency and secrecy and the informational environment in which we, we, we operate. So Russia are you listening is always a funny incident to me because if someone had leaked an email from Donald Trump to Vladimir Putin that says, if you find Hillary Clinton's emails, like please publish them, that would really help me out. And if that was a secret communication that had been kept secret from the public and then later was revealed, it would be an enormous scandal. In fact, it would probably be basically the final smoking gun in the question of collusion. Right? So the question of, was there an act of conspiracy between the criminal, the, the criminal conspiracy to break into the servers of Podesta and the DNC in order to aid a certain candidate? Was anyone on the campaign side actively aiding that conspiracy? That's sort of criminal question. We've got the kind of, it's like, right now it's like, you know, uh, Adam and God in the Sistine Chapel, their fingers are like this far apart. <laughs> and if, if, you got that, if you got that email, if that email were published, if it was on the front page of the Washington Post or New Times, it would be like, well, done. Donald Trump sent an email to an agent of Vladimir Putin saying, Please hack the email. Please go get Hillary Clinton's emails. Well, now we know, actually, thanks to Robert Mueller, that the day that he said, Russia, if you're listening, the GRU military, two of them in particular, began digging around in uh, that particular server. In Hillary Clinton's private server for the first time. But my point about this is that the fact that that was set on air in, into a camera while millions of people watched it means that it's, it doesn't have the same sort of weird sexiness of the secret thing made public. And the reverse of that is the John Podesta risotto recipe. So Donald Trump looks into a camera and says, please be an accessory to me in the commission of a crime to destroy my political opponent in the midst of these putatively free and fair elections. And it's like, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> and then it's like, whoa, we have our hands on a risotto recipe. <laughs> this is gonna be some serious clickbait. And there is a fundamental problem right now with the way that, that, trans, with the, way that the, the secret thing made public carries with it, is imbued with a kind of editorial import that I think is vestigial and that I think is being used to incredibly ill aims that I think that everybody needs to rethink. Yeah, I mean, that's part of Donald Trump's MO is, I mean, he just says the quiet parts out loud and we all become very desensitized to them and ultimately it's kind of like that guy, you know, saying that weird thing again or that, you know, he's outside of the norms again. Um, but I think that if you zoom out, the entire story of Russia's election interference is that. I mean, if you look at how the Trump campaign exploited the hacked emails, reading them at rallies, um, you know, constantly talking about the missing emails, it, this was, so, Russia succeeded. Russia succeeded in using him as an asset in that way. And in, in that sense, they were kind of colluding in the open, in front of everyone. But because there are still secrets being learned about the extent right. of the back channel communications that went on between members of Donald Trump's campaign, his associates, and Russians, then we assume that we really haven't, we, we don't know um, the extent of it yet. And we don't, but I think that the meat of it is still there. The meat of it is that the Russians hacked the DNC and John Podesta, they gave the emails to WikiLeaks, Donald Trump then used those emails. And it's not even just at that, it's stopping at that, it's also the massive disinformation campaign that happened on social media, the, all the propaganda. If you say that the Russians really had no impact on the election, you say that there's no proof that voters were swayed in any way by the Russians' disinformation, campaign, you know, things that were retweeted dozens and dozens of times by Donald Trump, by Donald Trump Jr., by his associates, then you're completely ignoring everything that, you know, everything that went on on social media and how much people pay attention to that. And that, I think, is a big piece of this that people are kind of missing the forest for the trees for. David, you've written about, I mean, I think that there's a kind of, 
let's say there's a sort of simple model that I think you have as a reporter, which is that secrecy is the enemy and transparency is the, is the goal, and that decisions made behind closed doors, particularly in a democratic society, deserve to be sort of wrenched out to see the light of day, that the public deserves to know what's going on. And so the, there's the things that are behind the door, and it's our job to sort of pull them out into the light. And you've written about the ways in which transparency can be sort of turned on its head. And I, I am increasingly of the belief that the informational environment we deal with is one of too much information, actually, as opposed to too much that's behind closed doors, and that the vestigial value we attribute to the thing pulled out as a secret ends up being a way of sort of facilitating misinformation. But, but I'm curious what you think. Uh, yeah, I, I, transparency, it's trendy now to talk of its weaponization. Um, that can be a function of uh, information overload, as I think you're suggesting. Um, it can be a function of plucking out selected details to paint a misleading story. Um, I, I guess I would just say that I, I am most sympathetic, however, to journalists uh, trying to maximize transparency in the national security space yep. above all other spaces um, because of the background conditions of extreme overclassification and secrecy. Um, where I've been most worried about the weaponization of transparency is in the ordinary stuff of domestic uh, policymaking uh, regulation. You have um, uh, organizations like Judicial Watch, which cut its teeth um, filing uh, uh, FOIA requests uh, one after the other after the other. It's you know trying to take down disfavored uh, Democratic uh, officials. Um, you have open meetings laws, which are well intentioned but are mainly populated by business lobbyists in a lot of contexts. And where the U.S. government is most transparent already. Um, uh, in the just ordinary bread and butter stuff of the administrative state, um, I think the marginal benefits from uh, pursuing even more transparency tend to be low. Uh, in the national security area, um, yeah. I, I, it, 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 the, the story is flipped. And so I, I do think um, reporters should be a little more cautious about the marginal unit of transparency from, say, the EPA which above all agencies, the Environmental Protection Agency has been most targeted by malicious use of open government laws, I think, um, than reporters are about uh, any national security agency. Well, and we're, we're watching this right now. The, the, so the Khashoggi, I mentioned at the beginning, but we're watching this right now play out in real time, right? So the, the, the Turkish intelligence services, I'm just gonna say it, not a great group. <laughs> not an awesome group. Uh, Erdogan has, Erdogan in some ways arguably has the, I mean, outside of states like, you know, North Korea, like arguably has the worst press freedom record in the entire world. Um, in terms of raw numbers of journalists that have been jailed, he has managed to take what was um, its own kind of anomalous version of something like liberal democracy and really un undermine it in ways that now mean that the free press in Turkey has essentially under his watch ceased to exist, uh, except in small pockets. And the Turkish intelligence services are extremely expertly playing their hand right now in the Western media through the selective use of leaks of their intelligence to put pressure on the Saudis to basically come clean about the fact that they killed Khashoggi. And I'm actually sort of amazed, Carol, like they're, they're doing a very good job of it. If just even from an editorial standpoint, they keep coming up with stuff that like keeps the story going. Today's right. body double thing is like, I saw that, I was like, well, we gotta do that. <laughs> you gotta do the body double story. Started, it's like started with a bone saw and now it's exactly. a body double. Yeah, I, I I think that the Erdogan administration's role in bringing truth to this story is is really stunning. But it also highlights once again Your point. <laughs> people people with some really dubious motives end up giving us good relevant information. And in we don't know if the Turks have made up whole. Cloth, That's a scary thing about certain this. elements of mm. this story, because we have not seen for our own selves the videos and the audio recordings that have been described. We've been able to verify with some certainty that they exist. Um, so my 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 uh, you know hands are kind of tied, waiting for what we can really verify and certify. But it, they have played their hand beautifully. They hate mm. the Saudis. They're using it like a, a, a battering ram, and they have really good verifiable information that we have published. Right. And they've, they've shown a light where nobody else could, which is shocking to admit, but they, that's what they did. 
We are still, though, in, in watching this battle with another, <clears throat> forgive me, David, you'll like this part, another intelligence agency, which is the Saudi intelligence agency, which is spreading all over the web right now videos of some of the 15 suspects um, laughing in Arabic at how ridiculous it is that they've been named as suspects, that they were never on the planes that landed at, um, in Turkey, and that uh, they were on their honeymoon in different locations, and they're providing like a counter narrative to say, oh, the American press, they totally bought that Turkish stuff hook, line, and sinker. Now, we went another couple of roads to make sure that, 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 that this was real information, but there is a battle between the totally. two of them, and who's right? It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, the parts that we know are, are right and that we can attribute to U.S. officials who've had some independent corroboration we've published, but what a mess. Well, David, I thought the New York Times did something interesting yesterday, and I don't have the paragraph in front of me, where there was a, there was a paragraph in the story, and this is actually something I think should be done more, um, and I think the Times has done this actually with some of the Broidy reporting, but there was a paragraph in the story basically saying, look, this is mostly coming from Turkish intelligence sources who have their own reasons to geopolitical reasons to basically stick it to the Saudis. Um, they are kind of the gatekeepers of this information. And, and, and just a kind of transparency about the motives, right? Like the sort of fourth wall breaking, which is, again, it's very hard to do in other cases where you have a secret source who you're pledged to protect. You can't be like, by the way, Deep Throat really had it out for you know Nixon because he got passed it. Like you, can't, you can't explain Mark Felt's motives without you know giving up who Mark Felt is. But it does seem to me as a good standard to operationalize in the cases where you can give some context about the motivations of the people at play, that that is a helpful thing to do. Yeah, it, it, and it's, to go back to your opening remarks, Chris, about what's new, what's not new is the need to do that. That was what the Pentagon Papers is about, right? Right. Reporters had covered the Vietnam War and accepted what American generals were saying, and it was a lie. And nobody really helped them, and very rarely helped, readers understand maybe this guy isn't really telling the truth when he's talking about the number of killed. I remember as a teenager going to see Peter Arnett, the uh, famous war correspondent, talk about covering the war. And he said, you know, he'd ask somebody about how many enemy were, were, were killed. And the spokesman said, do you want a wag? And he said, what's a wag? A wild ass, wild ass guess. And you know, not much has changed. Uh, so I think being honest with readers about what the possible motives are, what the limits to that information are, what our limits are, is really, really helpful. The problem, of course, is it's twofold. One is a lot of people aren't doing that in their reporting, so it, it, the message may be lost. But second and more important, what are readers supposed to do at that point? That, this, is a, this is a problem I find all the time, with, particularly with national security reporting, um, which is knowing there's various motives to the various players. This is true about the Russia reporting, right? Because so much of it's a black box. And then trying to kind of like put on my decoder glasses to say like, is this coming from the president's people? And are they, trying, do they want us to think X? And again, it, and it can start to drive you crazy. And I'm essentially a professional at this. And I think you're right that like the, the transparency of the motivation to the reader I'm inclined to think is good. But then it's like, well, okay, well, what do I do with the fact that it's the Turkish intelligence services? Like, what? <laughs> isn't it your job to tell me whether that matters or not? Like, <laughs> well, D David, isn't it uh, the case under the New York Times guidelines uh, that existed well before the Trump administration that reporters are supposed to do this? As I recall, after the Judith Miller uh, episode, where she was thought to have been um, kind of used by the Bush administration to put out what turned out to be misleading or false reports about weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq that the Times spearheaded an effort to adopt a self-imposed set of guidelines uh, about best practices for dealing with anonymous sources, and you should use grant anonymity uh, only when, when necessary, and even when you do so, you should provide as much information as possible uh, without blowing your sources cover about the information, how you got it, who the official is. And so, in, in some sense, this is just a, what Chris is describing is, is the industry standard, if, if rarely lived up to. That's still, but that's, those are still well, the, the operative the, guidelines. The, those right? still are, but, but I think both Natasha and Carol have underscored that we live in a world where you know, an, anonymity is really becoming an important part of getting the news. And yeah. that both 
valuable and dangerous. And you know, this goes back to what, what Chris was saying earlier. I remember when I was very new at the Times, uh, a, a sports copy editor complaining because someone would come with a story that was, you know, Jacoby Ellsbury is not, is, is, the Yankees want to trade Jacoby Ellsbury. Well, that's hardly a big secret, but if you put it according to sources, yes. it somehow sounds like a really interesting, oh, oh, they've actually seen the same games I've seen. So, oh. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it's, it's important to level with readers, but it goes back to Chris's point. The, the reader is actually looking for a lot from us at the same time. Right. I mean, I, I just want to just note quickly that there's kind of a genre now of, I think, it, I mean, I think people on them, um, the Lawfare blog have made this a particular focus where they've done a series on how to identify the sources that journalists use when they write a particular article um, and how you can determine the motivations behind the people who have leaked this material, given this material to the various publications and how that will then frame your understanding yeah. of the story. So there's clearly an appetite for a like a greater understanding of who's giving this stuff to the press and where people are getting it. Of course, that comes with its own set of dangers. I mean, journalists hate speculating on other journalist sources. It's kind of like one of the cardinal sins. No, we love it. <laughs> in private. Just in, in private. private. In private, it's all they do. In private, but <laughs> publicly, it, you're not supposed to do it. And so when these things are, are written, it's kind of really interesting looking as a journalist, like how people perceive um, and, and the interest that is there behind who is giving out this information. You know, I, I think that David and Natasha and David all just now perfectly summarized one of the hardest, most challenging parts of writing the lines, describing a source mm -hmm. who's sensitive with sensitive information. I do not to beat up Judy Miller. She was trying to do her job and... Um, Failed. Yes. <laughs> I covered um, the Scooter Libby trial and the CIA plane investigation and it was heart-wrenching for all journalists to watch that. But you can't describe the man who's gotten declassified automatically information from Vice President Cheney as a Hill staffer. Former Hill staffer. Former Hill staffer. <laughs> you can't do that because you're not really being yeah. honest with your readers. However, having said that very bold statement, I will also add that I hate writing the sentences about my sources when it's a mm. sensitive point because mm. I don't want to give anybody a roadmap. I do not want to give the White House Counsel or the Justice Department any trails to follow. There are people who've come forward, they've committed essentially a crime in, that, could be, that could be charged if somebody wanted to go at them. Why would yeah. I want to help anybody find those people? Third thing. Every time I can, when I write a sentence, I'm as expansive as I can possibly be about the motives of the people who are sharing information with me, and more importantly, how I did the story. Like, that is one of the, use your line, back to your opening statement about what's different. Huge swaths of America do not believe how much work we put into doing our job and getting it right, getting the facts sussing them out, verifying them. They have no idea how many times Marty Baron has said to me, I'm sorry, hon, you have not met the test. We're not publishing until you do more. They have no idea how hard we work. So now I have to add this new layer onto my reporting, which is telling you how I did it. Show so the you work. Can, you can see it. And I think that's been a Marty Baron. That's something I think that he has really led, led the way on, I think, in, in, in a great way. Um, I, the, the Washington Post stories, I mean, even with the, I remember the, the sort of Charlie Rose reporting, it was a lot, there was a lot shown about how the work went about doing that, that kind of reporting. Um, all right, well, why don't, why don't we open to some questions? I think there's microphones there. I would just ask you to keep the question precise and succinct. Hi. Albert Golson, uh, Cerulean Council. We review geopolitical affairs. Um, you talk about the sources and how you want to protect those sources, even though they have a hidden agenda, et cetera. And I'm referring to uh, Khashoggi. Um, it appears as if the Saudi government used a sledgehammer to kill a fly. Granted, he's well-respected, well-traveled. Um, it just seems to be that it, what I've read in the media doesn't go beyond that, that it's possible. Do you believe it's possible that he either met people or received such highly sensitive information? 
the sort of thing a guy who knows a guy who goes in the, knows a guy who's a direct existential threat to the Saudi government that the government really had to take some sort of action to, you know, to really silence him. No, I don't think there's any evidence of that, and my sense is that um, the the reason that MBS Mohammed bin Salman w did not like what he was doing and wanted to silence him is that he was writing in the Washington Post, and. To, to any I mean, indication of how important the American relationship is, the Saudis essentially got President Trump to come to Saudi Arabia for the first foreign trip, breaking with decades of precedent, usually go to Canada or Mexico. They, Mohammed bin Salman came to the US. They've spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in various investments, including in Silicon Valley. They, have, they are massively, massively invested in the alliance with the United States and particularly with cultivating elites in Washington circles. And what made Khashoggi different than anyone else was the fact that he was writing in English in the Washington Post. And I think that infuriated Mohammed bin Salman. Hi, I'm sorry that Marty Baron called you hun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, that was not a direct quote. I don't think he ever would actually say that. <laughs> Carol, that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, this program, those of you who had a chance to stick to all three of this is a fascinating program, starting with, uh, the, well, this is, you guys are the third one, and it just so happens that I subscribe, what, we subscribe to the Times and the, the Washington Post and the Atlantic, and uh, Roar, L Ryan Roar, Roar, Lion Roar is what I'm trying to say, I have a Columbia degree, and our spectrum channel is set to channel 14. <laughs> but one of the things said in the first panel that would compare to the third panel and the second panel was someone said, this guy happened to be an Arnold and Porter lawyer who was on the uh, George Bush's staff in 19, uh, 2001 during the uh, Iraq War. He said that, well, you know, this stuff goes up and down and it's really just going to come back to normal and don't have to worry about all this craziness now going on. And um, I don't agree with that because I think there's a new leg in the stool. And the, the Internet is really changing things drastically, and you guys reflected on it. But you know, one of the things that that gets me is that, you know, they think that Joe McCarthy had Twitter. <laughs> it didn't happen. Father Coughlin didn't have Facebook. So we're looking at that now. I'm just trying to say, you, according to 42% of the American people, are the enemy of the people. I'm not making the, the quote up. But that really affects me as a non-professional in your business. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what does that mean to you? Here's the question then. He's putting a cue up in front of you. I thought I would say the cue now. How does that affect you guys? Any fellow enemy of the people. I, I'm taking my thoughts. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I don't, I, I, you know, my feeling about that stuff, that that rhetoric particularly, is that it's, um, it's dangerous in a sort of democratic sense, but like, I don't, I, like, it's not. Right. We just ignore, can, yeah. You can I, say whatever you want about me. Yeah. I, you know, I'm going to do my show every night. And I, what, what I do think is worrisome is that the, the civic element of it, which is this idea that like, and th that, that's Carol's point about like, people think that like anonymous sources are literally just made up. They think like there's all sorts of this sort of epistemic funhouse that we're in that is really unmooring um, for, for, for everyone. For I, I, don't, oh, I, I don't take it personally like Carol's getting hurt, but I, I do find some pain in watching some of my colleagues get bashed. I remember this moment um, when Jim Acosta was getting yelled at and the finger and people screaming to try to drown him out at a rally. I don't know Jim, we're not friends. I know him to pass him by. That kind of broke my heart because he's working his tail off and he's being you know, attacked for trying to get information and provide it to the people who are yelling at him. And that that's something Something's broken. We need to figure out a solution to that. And the only solution I can think of is showing people the care we take with our work. And that's why I came to this panel today. I want to spread that word about the care we take. And something that is great that Jim does is the people that are hurling the most vile insults at him at these rallies, he goes up to them at the end and he says, hey, let's chat. Let's, you know, let's talk about why you think I'm the enemy. And ultimately, it's the guy is saying, "Oh, you know, I just thought it was, I thought it was funny," yeah. and he just starts bursting out laughing, and they end up being, you know, good old friends by the end of it. And I think 
personally, that's kind of what helps me get through it is that so much of this just seems like one big act and it is dangerous and it is, you know, it, it's, it's breaking with all norms, especially coming from the president. But, but it's become kind of like, you know, a knee-jerk kind of rallying cry. And, and it's just unclear whether or not the people screaming at the press during the Trump rallies, you know, once you actually go up and talk to them, whether they actually even know what they're saying. I mean, well, David, thankfully, as a bearded, sweater-wearing Ivy League professor, I think I'm a friend of the, the people, uh, like the reporters <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Trump worldview. Um, but uh, just another piece of your question I'll say briefly was on the internet changing everything and technology. Um, I'll just note quickly that there was a period in the Obama administration when people thought uh, the rise of digital technology was going to be the end of national security reporting because the leakers were going to be so much easier to catch. Um, you could just, uh, you wouldn't even necessarily need to subpoena a reporter. You could just find metadata on someone's cell phone and prosecute the leaker. Um, that, however, was quickly, I think, um, uh, th that's still an important dynamic, but uh, that failed to account for the rise of encryption technologies and uh, a secure drop, um, which technologically have actually enabled reporters and leakers to, in some situations, get the upper hand on enforcers. And, but the rise of secure drop and encryption has also enabled hackers to come in the door. So I think the proposition that the internet or technology um, has en had any very clear uh, implications in any direction for national security reporting is, has been belied by the um, complicated cross-cutting dynamics of the last decade. All right. Hi, um, uh, my name is Shoshana Sutkin. I work with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, my question is not necessarily national security related, um, well, strictly national security. Um, it's more about um, kind of the future of journalism in and politics and the relationship there. Um, just because, um, to my knowledge, um, an administration has not really undermined the press as much as this one has done. And my question is whether you think in the future that will improve with future administrations or whether something, some kind of like bond of respect was broken there um, and whether you can expect um, better or worse in the future. I mean, one of the ironies, right, is that like from a public opinion standpoint, the president has, um, for instance, there's record highs of people saying that immigration is good for the US right now. Um, there's record highs, actually press trust has gone up, right? So there's a sort of backlash effect where to the people that he, that, you know, are sort of um, in the percentage of the country that uh, admires him or believes what he says, that, that, that when he makes these enemies, it matters to them, but there's a kind of backlash effect for everyone else. The bigger problem to me has to do with these sort of two kind of trends. One is, um, and the last, uh, question sort of references. One is the fact that the, the platform monopolies have unbelievable amounts of power and everyone kind of lives or dies on them. And that concentrated power is incredibly dangerous. Um, you know, the, 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 the Burmese junta carrying out basically a genocide of the Rohingya um, by, or in Myanmar, uh, junta carrying out a genocide of the Rohingya by using Facebook the data that we've seen about anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiment in different precincts of Germany based on face access to Facebook, um, the pictures that Sheryl Sandberg has shown of the war room for Facebook where they're gonna like guarantee the security of everyone's elections, and it's like, awesome. I'm great that you have 30 engineers with monitors who have the job of guaranteeing everyone's election security, but that's not how this should work. Like, it's too much concentrated power. So the, the, the problem is we talk about the Washington Post and the New York Times, the Atlantic as these sort of brands, but most people are getting things in their newsfeed that's disaggregated from the, 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 the title of the, you know, the enterprise. And so the, 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 the fundamental distributional questions to me are more dangerous to what journalism is and how it plays a role in American civic society than the sort of top-down attack. But the second sort of trend is the fact that those two things have been married together via the kind of Russian model, particularly, of the sort of state using disinformation and the sort of bad faith exercise of sock puppets and things like that that I think is, is gonna get worse and more dangerous. 
I was just going to chime in and say that it used to be these gatekeeper institutions would be revered by the Walter Cronkite generation. These are the people we believe, these are the sources we trust. I know that the Times and the Post both, and I don't know about the Atlantic, have put a lot of energy into um, education programs for young readers to try to explain to them the veracity of your source, the trustworthiness of your source, meaning us, by the way. Um, and when you're getting all your information from a telephone, you have, sorry, did I just say telephone? <laughs> cell phone? Um, when you're getting all your information from a cell phone, you have no idea what it is. And, and people need, young people need to learn and we need to teach them, are these reliable? It's a cliche, reliable sources, but there are people that spend a lot of energy and there are people that don't. So you need to find the ones that do. Andre? Yeah. Um, Andre Dobriansky. Uh, so the, in my mind, when I'm hearing all of you speak, especially when you get down to the minutia of what should be in your paper or what should be in your broadcast, it reminds me of like watching The Walking Dead, and there's always that one person who's like, but I can't take a life. <laughs> but the zombies are coming like nonstop. So, even though wait, the, we're the naive ones who are not. <laughs> we're, you're saying we're not ruthless enough to kill. I'm saying that there is a pipeline that you fully acknowledge, and you just mentioned it, of things getting around the platforms that you were talking, the papers or the networks or the Cronkites, and Sinclair is in how many homes, or the DM rooms uh, on Twitter or the social uh, network that are being weaponized, for lack of a better word, uh, and that it's a pipeline that people. People don't just believe that you might not be writing stuff because they don't understand what you do, but because stuff is being fed to them yeah. uh, in a very you know, direct basis. And I'm not saying this to be a nihilist, but, but because part of it, and you brought it up before, is because there is an active war going on. And on the Russian side, over 20 people have been killed since the election that we know of, like people who work in consulates and, and embassies and stuff. So, when you're talking about still discussing about whether I should print the Manafort um, daughter stuff, well, people know about the Strzok and Page uh, text messages, not so much even because of the uh, leaks out of the uh, co Congress testimony, but because it's being pumped to them through social media. They, they, write, they read it there, not really through your uh, gatekeepers. Right, so the question is like, is, is, the, is playing the gate, like in a world of distributed platforms and, 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 and information warfare, like, why do we need David McGraw Just making these, these discussions? This is me, <laughs> all right. You know, what you beautifully yeah. said, when Justify it's already your job. out there, maybe we'll yeah. talk about yeah. it. You know, it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's, the, the first thing I'd say is I think that the, the research on, for instance, fake news and disinformation is much more uh, inconclusive than people think, right? I agree. That, that, when one study was done of, of heavy users of fake news, they happened to be very heavy users of the Washington Post and the New York Times as well. You don't know what to make of that. What, what is that? Is that them going, well, I wonder if they're still lying over there at the Post? <laughs> or is that someone going like, well, that sounds like crazy. I'm going to go see if the Post said it because, you know. So we don't know. And, and people are influenced. They're, compli they're complex. They're influenced by their peer group and so forth. So I, I do think that there's... Um, um, still a, a, a very, very important place for those media that are going to be the gold standard. And I think in some ways more important than ever. And I think that you're going to see those trusted sources emerge. I think that the, the, the role of, of Facebook as an arbiter of, of trusted is not a good development. And, you know, I, we obviously are going to benefit from that in the short run. But the idea that, that someone as powerful as Facebook is going to be telling people um, what to, who to believe and what to believe is really contrary to the model that the First Amendment was built on. So I think this is actually an area that the media can capitalize on, which is, so in the era of like deep fakes, for example, where you have videos that, you know, you see Obama talking, but it's actually someone else putting words into his mouth and it sounds like him and it looks like him, but it's actually not anything he's really saying. So that's an extreme example, but you know, variations on that word, you just can't tell what's real and what's not. I think there's an opportunity as we go forward for newsrooms to maybe invest in some kind of intensive training for journalists to become the arbiters of this stuff. So like, you know, forensics 
and things like that. And, and things where, you know, an expert with a trained eye could, could be able to say, this is not true, this is fake, and then write about it and, and kind of debunk it. And one example of an organization that's fantastic at this is Bellingcat. Bellingcat has just become kind of the gold standard of, you know, just doing this really, really deep forensics digital analysis of everything and debunking, you know, whether it's lies told by the Russian government or things we see on the internet that we can't actually believe, you know, whether or not they're true. Um, you know, if you kind of merged like a Bellingcat with the New York Times, a Bellingcat with Washington Post, Bellingcat with the Atlantic, it might be the perfect combination. So I, I see an opportunity here. Um. Chris, in the beginning you've said uh, that people say this is all different, but it's happened before. I think the big differences you've all covered uh, really brilliantly in, in terms of the quantum, the speed, and the complexity of propaganda now and what's being turned into propaganda is, uh, and the power of the Facebooks, et cetera. These are the things that are different. And <clears throat> dealing with this stuff as it comes down the pike, the, the, the speed with which you have to react is kind of impossible in real time. So how do you construct devices to fend this off, you know, to uh, parry the sword yeah. uh, that's coming down? What are you guys going to invent to save us? I don't know. I mean, I, to me, it's a, real, it's, it's, a, it's a real conundrum that we wrestle with all the time, which is how much do you, you know, there's this, there's a sort of genre and jo of joke on the internet about like fact checking and how sort of poorly up to the task like the, the fact checking is, right? Um, particularly in the face of, you know, essentially either foreign government's propaganda or our own government's propaganda. Um, we, we have pretty good research that like when you present people with debunkings, it just confirms their priors. Right? So, in fact, it, it, what that tends to do is activate, people reach deeper cognitively to construct things that will then allow them to not have to give up the prior belief. So what you tend to do is like, my favorite statistic about this is that the, the worst views on climate are, are among the most educated Republicans. So the highest percentage of climate denialism is, the, is, is Republicans with a graduate degree or more as opposed to Republicans with just a high school degree. And that is because they are using their education and their news, their, their, their uh, informational abilities to construct a more ironclad theory of the case about why the libs are lying about the climate. So that's a very nihilistic place you end up in. <laughs> it's, we have to choose this all the time. Like, okay, should we do a block tonight about how like Soros isn't actually sponsoring the caravan? Mm -hmm. Or do we, by doing a block about how Soros isn't sponsoring a caravan, simply reinforce the notion that it would even be possible that George Soros was sponsoring the caravan, which itself is like as, which is a totally ridiculous idea. I might just add that in, in the transparency literature, there's a little strain that argues that, uh, at least in principle, under conditions of information overload and massive uh, disinformation and uh, great complexity of a lot of the relevant information, the role of trusted intermediaries, as they're sometimes described, becomes uh, ever more important. Um, those can be uh, mainstream media organizations like the ones represented here, but they can also be um, other civil society actors like the organization um, that looks into, um, what's the name again? Bellingcat. Bellingcat, thank you. Um, and it, it can also be government bodies. Inspectors general, I think, play that role when they issue what are supposed to be authoritative reports interpreting complex events within an agency that uh, some people are concerned about. Um, th so the, the, uh, an optimistic story would be that given current informational conditions, um, we need to reinvest in trusted intermediaries of a, of a, of a wide range. Um, the, but, but the pessimistic uh, uh, next move, I think, is to recognize that under certain other conditions of our informational environment, including uh, rampant political polarization, which leads to certain forms of motivated reasoning, um, whatever uh, uh, the facts suggest, um, not to mention the filter bubble, that people, the way people consume social media, the co highly concentrated structure of social media, um, all of those other features of the informational environment disable trusted intermediaries from actually earning trust with the populations that most, you'd most want to reach. So um, in principle, there's an elegant solution, but I think uh, it's, it's confounded by 
uh, the way people actually tend to consume media uh, under current political conditions. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm a big believer in fact checking as a, as a addition to the media, to, and I think that, that anybody who's doing it's doing a great job on it. But I did have pause yesterday because I saw USA Today ran an op-ed from the president on Medicare for all, and then they did a fact check against it. The fact check was longer than the op-ed, and it, it made you wonder, why didn't yeah. an editor just do what an editor yeah. should do when you get an op-ed like that, which is to say, not for us. Mm. Yeah, the op-ed we ran on Tuesday was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, um, I want to kind of go back to the beginning of this whole panel, which is really interesting, about leaks from Russia, WikiLeaks, North Korea, how we're going to screen them and, and decide what, okay. When the leaks are from malevolent powers, that's one thing. What about leaks from allied powers? I'm thinking of the Israel-Iran dispute. Israel and Iran are basically at war in an information sense. Just before Trump pulled out of the Iran Accord, Sharo, uh, Netanyahu released a massive trove of documents that they said they had stolen from the Iranians, actually not by hacking, but by an armed assault on an Iranian building. It got massive coverage in the American papers. I don't recall too much skepticism yeah. about the content. At the very heart of the Iranian nuclear debate at the UN elsewhere, is a document that the Iranians say is a forgery that was apparently stolen by the Israelis and the MEK, the Mujine al khalq which was at the time, at least a terrorist designated organization. Now it's Giuliani's favorite group. <laughs> and, 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 you know, David Posen mentioned the Espionage Act. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that a, a Pentagon official was charged with leaking with the assistance of the Israeli embassy to AIPAC documents about Iran's military programs. They were charged, the AIPAC guys were charged under the yeah. espionage. Okay, that's a thing for lawyers that was dismissed. But, but the Israeli information uh, is taken pretty much at face value as far as I can see. And I, in 2002, I was covering the Iraq war. Saddam released a huge stock of documents about this high saying we don't have any damn WMD. It was dismissed out right. of hand by the mainstream press but it was all true. I mean, he didn't have them, and that, those documents showed it, you know? So I, I don't, I think there needs to be more balance in the way like information from the Israelis is covered about Iran's nuclear program. Right. Versus the way, just the way we look so, at anything else, right? Yeah, so the, the question, I think it's a really interesting one, right? Like we keep talking about um, hostile foreign powers, adversarial foreign powers, but of course, the point is that lots of foreign powers that may not be hostile or adversarial are engaging in informational warfare and have all sorts of misaligned incentives. In the case of the Netanyahu, the, the Iranian documents, right, that was, it wasn't like that was a trove that was, he did a big, uh, he did a, a, a song and dance thing. I mean, he talked about it, right? He did a big presentation, clearly aimed at President Trump, very obviously. Um, and so there, I don't think there was much question about whether that would be covered because that was a big public event that here's the leader of Israel is making his case. Um, but I think it's a good, a really good point and question about, I do think it does creep into these judgments is, is it France, is it Israel, is it North Korea, is it Iran, that like that colors the question about the validity of what's happening if it's informational warfare being undertaken by a state that we're friendly with as opposed to a state that we have a hostile relationship with. But I think you're right. I mean, I think the bar has to be high. I, I thought that question was just so Carol could bring up Judy Miller one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just etched in my mind. I understand. <laughs> uh, Gabriel Avgerinos, Energy and Climate Mentors International. First of all, kudos to the three journalists, Chris, Carol, and Natasha. You've done a fantastic job. You do it every night whether it's on press or on TV. Um, Thank you. My, I don't have any Pulitzers to show for it. <laughs> <laughs> my it's question fine. to you is, this is such a successful forum, and Carol mentioned in terms of education, I'm an educator myself, have you thought of the idea, let's call it anti-fake news or true news, of taking it on the road, literally, and being able to go into areas that, Chris, you have done 
and on several occasions, mm -hmm. especially for climate change issues and, and other things, where you go in the field. And the reason I'm saying that is each one of you has a platform, but unfortunately that platform is either watched or listened to or read by people who already believe in what you say. By being in the field, and I think Chris will attest to that, you're hearing and talking to people that are on the other side, which is what we need to do more of. I, I think that's true. One, one thing I would say about that is, don't underestimate who reads the Washington Post and the New York Times and even watches MSNBC. It is, it is always, like, I think there's this idea that's gotten in people's head a little bit about, and I think part of it is because we use these sort of demographic shorthands and we use these sort of categorical shorthands to talk about American politics in these sort of groups and chunks. But it's, you know, there's 350 million people out there. And the, the actual individual um, strangeness of every individual citizen is just boundless. So people, you know what I mean? Like people are individuals and there's all sorts of people reading the Washington Post and New York Times in areas that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily associate with, with, with their coverage. There's all kinds of people that I meet who watch MSNBC who don't even, who do not share my politics and who have all kinds of different views. So I sometimes think that we overthink about how much the kind of choir preaching is happening. That said, I do think that to Carol's point, and, and this is a broader thing, basic information about what a free press is and how it functions is not is in short supply. And it has been exacerbated by the most powerful and famous person in the country yep. essentially trying to uneducate people on those very topics. And I do think there's an, a really important role to play, particularly I think with students, about just what, what the civic function of a free press is, what it looks like, and how you go about being an informed news consumer, which is, a very, which is an increasingly more difficult thing to be. Right, and I mean, basic things like, no, we don't make up sources. You wouldn't be able to be at a place like the Post or the Times or the Atlantic if you just made up sources. You would lose your career. Things like journalists lie awake at night wondering if they got something wrong in a piece. I mean, it's like the, the biggest fear that a journalist has is getting something wrong, a good journalist anyway. Um, you know, just basic, basic things about the way the media and journalism operates, um, assuming that they're operating in good faith, which most of the time I would say they are, a few ex exceptions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think that for a very long time there's been kind of almost a blind faith in the biggest institutions, like the New York Times and the Post, but I think that we're making efforts now to become more transparent about it. I mean, down to including a paragraph, in, you know, explaining the motivations perhaps of certain sources, yeah. whether it be the Qataris or the Russians or whoever. Um, so I think that we're on the right track. I think we could definitely do more um, in terms of educating the public and pushing back on this idea that sources are made up. I mean, Donald Trump, phoned in pretending to be his own publicist, you know, years ago. He relies all the time on anonymously sourced pieces to reinforce his own um, narrative. Um, but yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think more could be done. So don't us underestimate who reads the Post and the Times, but do underestimate who reads law review articles. Um, I think uh, my relevance here is, is, is far, far less than uh, these amazing reporters. Um, I'll just note uh, a quick anecdote that once in my life I was on the other side not just studying from the outside this world, but um, when I graduated law school, I worked as an aide to Senator Ted Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I was a low-level aide, and no one much noticed me, but one enterprising young reporter from the nation sought me out, and I was quite flattered, as realizing uh, that I could be a source. I went, and, uh, um, and his name was Chris Hayes. <laughs> and I, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'll say no more. About that. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right, I think this will be the last question, and then we'll yeah. wrap up. I, uh, just a quick reaction. But I'm Patrick Slattery, by the way. Uh, I work in uh, cybersecurity. It, if you just take the assumption that in, the, say, next 18 months to three years, artificial intelligence will reach a point where even digital forensics will be futile, uh, what do you see changing? Yeah, I mean, this is the sort of like completely altered reality situation. Yeah, um, I don't know. I haven't. I guess I'm too. I'm too besieged by the difficulties of the present moment to to allow myself to attach anxiety to the future. Um, so I, I'm I'm kind of across the, across that rickety, terrifying bridge when we come to it. I completely concur. I'm exhausted. 
I can't think, as, as you know, I don't understand how my current technology works, so. Except that it has a backside. <laughs> <laughs> you can get things out of I am so the, exhausted. The characterization. <laughs> Well, I could say that in the transparency law world, uh, there's active debate on this, and there's a sense in which the old paradigm, whether you're filing a Freedom of Information Act request or uh, getting a leaked document reported in the press, uh, the old paradigm was the, of the smoking gun memo would reveal right. the ill intentions of some government official about some plan. Uh, and um, there would not just be transparency about what happened, but in intelligibility. There'd be a story that would be coherent. Uh, but when it comes to government decisions and business decisions made by algorithms, there's no, there's no story to, to be revealed as a black body. There may, it may also be a causal in the sense that yeah. even the designers of the algorithm don't have a theory about what they're trying to achieve. It learns as it goes. And so I think it really complicates the whole paradigm of, uh, of transparency we've been operating in. In Europe, they're moving to the notion of explainability. Uh, and this would apply to reporters as well as uh, um, government officials fulfilling information requests. So you, you need not only to release the underlying data, the code, um, but give a coherent explanation. So it's just another uh, profound challenge for reporters and, and lawmakers. All right, I want to uh, thank my fellow panels, Carol Lennig, David McGraw, Natasha Bertrand, and David Posen. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>